Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. For many women, a nice long walk in the evenings is our zen time, a time to play a podcast and forget our worries. Or maybe you are a jogger, a time to listen to your music and feel the adrenaline flow. Unfortunately, statistics show that 58% of women have faced some sort of harassment on a walk or run. And it's not like we are unaware of the dangers. We live with a constant vigilance that most men will never really understand. We try to park close to grocery stores if we have to go at night, talking on the phone while walking and holding our keys as a weapon. For our nightly alone time walks or runs, we have been forced to find different, more well-lit routes instead of our favorite trails. And it's not only at nighttime. Many women have been abducted in broad daylight. We carry pepper spray. We always have our phones. We tuck our ponytails under hats. Sometimes we forego music or podcasts altogether for safety. Or sometimes we only wear one earbud hoping we could still hear someone come up behind us. Or we find walking or jogging buddies so we aren't alone. So much for our much needed alone time. Buddies are great, but sometimes I just want to clear my head, you know? Christy Cornwell felt safe on the rural road outside of her parents' home. In the tiny town, everyone knew each other and recognized every car that passed. And Christy was tough. She taught self-defense. She was a biker. She was a badass. And she disappeared on the evening of August 11, 2009, while on her cell phone with her boyfriend. Welcome to episode 143, The Disappearance of Christy Cornwell. Union County, Georgia, is located in the north-central portion of Georgia bordering the North Carolina border. The area is well known and loved for being very outdoorsy, as it's nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Chattahoochee National Forest. There are lots of hiking trails there, blanketed with the gorgeous scenery of forests, lakes, and waterfalls. Prior to the Georgia Gold Rush in 1829, the northern parts of Georgia were owned by the Cherokee. Because the northern areas were so remote, miners didn't get there until 1830. But they soon found that the gold in northern Georgia was better than anywhere else, so white settlers began flocking to the remote area. Of course, the settlers greatly upset the Cherokee, who had been in the area for generations. Tensions with the Cherokee in that area of Georgia were part of a larger national problem between white settlers and indigenous people who were there first. Everywhere in the South, white settlers wanted to expand into lands belonging to five indigenous tribes. When former General Andrew Jackson was elected president in 1828, he succeeded in pushing the Indian Removal Act through Congress in 1830. Despite legal victories by the Cherokee, the United States government began to force the tribe to move west to present-day Oklahoma in 1838. What became known as the Trail of Tears was especially hard on the Cherokee, who lost some 4,000 out of 15,000 who had been forced to walk west in extremely harsh conditions. The U.S. government spent the next 30 years forcing indigenous peoples to move westward, beyond the Mississippi River. With the Cherokee forced to move west, their land was stolen and given away as part of the Georgia Land Lottery, a system used by the government to redistribute land to white male citizens. In 1832, the 323 square mile area known as Union County was founded. While the exact origin of the name is unknown, the county was most likely named after the Union Party, a political group that supported removing indigenous people so white settlers could take over. 
the man who came up with the union name, John Thomas, who served Union County in the Georgia House of Representatives, said, Name it Union, for none but Union-like men reside in it. In 1835, about a one-square-mile area of Union County was incorporated as the town of Blairsville, named after James Blair, who was a sergeant and Native American spy during the Revolutionary War. Blairsville is located less than 15 miles south of the North Carolina border and is two hours northeast of Atlanta. Besides gold mining, the Union County area was great for raising livestock and farming many agricultural products like corn, wheat, rye, and tobacco. However, the area wasn't conducive to plantation farming, so there weren't many slave owners. Due to the lack of slave owners in the years leading up to the Civil War, the majority of Union County residents were pro-Union. In fact, the county's delegates voted against secession in 1861. But after the state of Georgia voted to secede, the majority in Union County flipped to support the Confederacy. Following the war, Union County became an agricultural hub after railroads helped farmers expand the areas they could distribute to. Today, the area has a population of around 23,000 and remains agricultural while also being a tourist destination due to its beautiful scenery and hiking opportunities. To this day, Blairsville remains the only unincorporated town in Union County, and with a population of around 700, most residents know each other and feel safe in their small town. This isn't the first Southern Fried episode to take place in Union County. Episode 113, Blood Mountain, the National Forest Serial Killer, focused on the abduction and murder of 24-year-old Meredith Emerson. I'll give you a short summary in case you've not listened to that episode. On New Year's Day 2008, Meredith went hiking with her dog on Blood Mountain in Union County. When she didn't return that evening, she was reported missing and classified as an overdue hiker. But when searchers went to look for Meredith, they found evidence that she had been kidnapped near the Byron Herbert Reese Memorial Trailhead. Starting on January 2nd, despite snow and low temperatures, hundreds of people searched for Meredith, but there was no sign of her or her dog. The next day, investigators received a major tip telling them to look into 61-year-old Gary Michael Hilton. Then on January 4th, while investigators looked into Hilton, another tip came in. Meredith's purse, wallet, and a pair of men's bloody boots were found in a dumpster. And across the street, wandering around on a parking lot, was Meredith's dog. The next day, authorities received a tip that Hilton was cleaning out his van at a gas station. He was arrested for kidnapping Meredith and refused to talk to the police. But that changed when authorities told Hilton they had found a treasure trove of evidence in his van evidence that linked him to Meredith's kidnapping and to the murders of John and Irene Bryant in North Carolina and Cheryl Dunlap in North Florida. The prosecution made him a deal. They would take the death penalty off the table if he confessed and took them to Meredith's body. He accepted the deal, confessed, and led authorities into the Dawson Forest Wildlife Management Area, where Meredith's body was later recovered. On January 31, 2008, Hilton pled guilty to Meredith's kidnapping and murder and was later sentenced to life. But the justice system wasn't through with him. He still faced charges for the other three murders he had been linked to. The horrific loss of Meredith Emerson did bring about new legislation protecting victims and their families called the Meredith Emerson Memorial Privacy Act. After Hustler Magazine filed a Freedom of Information Act for crime scene photos they planned to publish in the porn mag, her family sprang to action with the help of state lawmakers. They reacted with swift force to generate and pass a law that blocks the release of crime scene photos that depict mutilated bodies and or nude bodies. House Bill 1322 was passed in March 2010 and a 163 to 0 vote. But in the summer of 2009, Union County residents were still trying to overcome the loss of Meredith Emerson. 
Gary Hilton had committed such a brutal crime, and it had deeply affected them. Union County was a safe area. Things like what Hilton did to Meredith just didn't happen there. So it must have come as a complete shock when in August 2009, another Union County woman was abducted. The air was thick with fear, anxiety, and even despair. This couldn't be happening. Not again. This is the story of Christy Cornwell. Born on December 20th, 1970, Christy Lee grew up on a Blairsville farm with her parents, Joanne and Harold, and her younger brother, Richard. The Cornwell kids absolutely loved living out in the country where they could ride horses and explore the outdoors. It was a total dream come true for the whole family. Christy graduated from Union County High School and then headed off to North Georgia College where she studied criminal justice. After graduating, Christy put her new degree to work at the state prison in Blairsville, the town's county sheriff's office, and the state probation office. Then in the mid-1990s, Christy and her then-husband welcomed a son they named Brody. Christy's mom, Joanne, told producers for the TV show Disappeared that Christy loved Brody more than anything in the world. He was the joy of her life. But at some point, Christy and her husband divorced and split custody of their son. And while she would go on to marry two other men, both of those relationships ended in divorce as well. When Christy wasn't working or spending time with Brody, she taught self-defense classes and enjoyed riding her motorcycle. She even drove down the Tail of the Dragon, an 11-mile stretch of US-129 that begins in North Carolina and ends in Tennessee. Although there are no intersecting roads, houses with driveways, or businesses, the Tail is known as one of the most dangerous roads for bikers in the country due to the amount of S-curves. There are 318 to be exact. In fact, it's so dangerous that in the last 10 years, over 30 motorcycle riders have died, and semi-trucks are banned from driving on the highway. In the early 2000s, always known to think everything through, Christy realized that working as a probation officer was no longer the best career for her. She quit her job and enrolled at Dalton State College, where she went on to study medical laboratory technology. For the summer break of 2009, Christy was interning at Union General Hospital while temporarily staying with her parents in their home just west of Blairsville off Jones Creek Road. It seemed like life was really going well for 38-year-old Christy. She'd even recently been lucky in love after meeting a pastor named Doug Davis online. He lived two hours away in Atlanta, but they still saw each other multiple times a week. And Christy and Doug would also talk on the phone a lot, especially when she walked down the two-lane country road her parents lived off of. This was something Christy did every single day. It was the only way she could relieve the pain she suffered after she had injured her tailbone during a fall that previous spring. Her favorite time of day to walk was in the late afternoon or evening, because it was way cooler then. This meant that she often walked in the dark which worried her mother, Joanne. But Christy didn't even think twice about it. She was well-trained in self-defense and believed in how safe the small town was. On August 11th, at around 9 p.m., Christy left her parents' house for her evening walk. She put in her earpiece to talk on the phone with Doug and set out on Jones Creek Road. According to the Gainesville Times, she passed Union Baptist Church and headed towards a remote road surrounded by pasture and a few farmhouses. Between 9.15 and 9.20 p.m., Christy told Doug that a car was approaching her and had stopped near her. Then Doug heard a scuffle, and Christy screamed, Don't take me! He kept listening and heard Christy say something about someone tying her up, that she had a son and that she'd grown up in the area. Doug thought she was trying to give him some clues, while also reasoning with the abductor. When the call was dropped, he called 911. But because he was in Atlanta, 
The dispatcher couldn't help him. They gave him the non-emergency line for the Blairsville area, but Doug got no answer. He tried other ways to get a hold of authorities, but was unsuccessful. Finally, he called information for Harold and Joanne Cornwell's number. When Doug called, Joanne picked up. He quickly explained what happened and told her to call 911. Joanne later said she couldn't believe what he was telling her, but she knew it was real. Doug immediately left Atlanta and headed to the Cornwell residence, while Joanne called the Union County Police, Christie's dad Harold, and her brother Richard. While she waited for Harold, Richard, and Doug to show up, Joanne went out driving the route she knew Christy liked to walk. She was about to pass Union Baptist when she saw a police cruiser in the lot. She pulled in and told the officer what was going on. She later said the officer looked at her, shocked, and said, Things like that don't happen around here. But he quickly radioed his superiors, who then contacted the GBI. Luckily for the Union County Police, a number of GBI agents were already in the county investigating a homicide, so they were able to arrive at the Cornwell place very quickly. Meanwhile, Christie's brother Richard was driving in from Knoxville. By the time he arrived at the Cornwell house, Doug was already there and investigators were interviewing him, trying to find out exactly what happened during their phone call. They asked if there was anyone who would want to harm Christie, and he said no. She had never mentioned anyone. Of course, investigators were highly suspicious of Doug's story, but after verifying his whereabouts, they felt like he was telling the truth and decided to take him at his word. Christy had been abducted while out on a walk. While authorities set up search headquarters, Richard went out walking along Jones Creek Road, searching through the knee-high grass on the shoulder for any evidence. As dawn arrived, he was walking around a half mile from Union Baptist when he found one of Christie's flip-flops. Richard immediately contacted investigators who started searching the area. They found Christie's other shoe, her eyeglasses, and the cell phone earpiece. It was like she had been yanked right out of her shoes and then disappeared into thin air. Christie had been abducted off the side of Jones Creek Road. This was officially a kidnapping case, and authorities needed to figure out if Christie's abduction was targeted or random. Officers set up roadblocks and started canvassing over 400 homes, while authorities called in more help. When all was said and done, at least 15 agencies sent law enforcement personnel to help. The GBI alone sent 60 special agents. Meanwhile, in an effort to avoid the circus atmosphere, Christie's boyfriend, Doug, made the difficult decision to not be directly involved in the search. He wanted everyone to focus on Christie, not him. Plus, the Cornwells had asked Doug not to give any interviews because they were worried he would accidentally share information from the phone call that could jeopardize the case. For the first two days, more than 100 officers and volunteers focused their search on a three-mile area encompassing Jones Creek Road. There were three types of searches going on, sky, ground, and water. On the ground, they used dogs, horses, ATVs, and more. And for the water, dive teams searched in four nearby lakes and rivers. But even with all that manpower and resources, there was still no sign of Christy anywhere. While some authorities were out searching, others were investigating tips. One of the first promising leads came from the caretaker of Union Baptist. Right before Christy disappeared, the caretaker saw her walk by the church. He saw a white SUV drive by, and this car didn't belong to anyone who lived on that road. Remember, this was a rural road, one almost exclusively used by residents, so there weren't a lot of strange cars driving by. When investigators told Doug about this tip, he remembered something that happened around four days before. He had been visiting Christy at her parents' place. When they went out for her nightly walk, they were gone for around 30 to 45 minutes when a silver SUV slowly approached them from behind. The car got within three to four feet of them and then sped off. Doug now wondered if it was connected, and so did authorities. 
While some investigators were following the SUV leads, others were looking into Christie's history as a probation officer to see if there was a link there. To help out, probation officers were questioning nearly every registered sex offender in Union County and nearby counties, but there wasn't a single lead there. On day three of the search, August 14th, investigators caught a break after a homeowner cutting their grass near the Georgia-North Carolina border about three and a half miles from the Cornwells fell on Christie's phone. While finding this piece of evidence helped narrow down the abductor's route, it was also devastating because it meant Christie had been most likely taken out of state. One GBI agent told Disappeared that the homeowner lived off Notley Dam Road, which was a good way to leave Union County and go over the North Carolina border. Although it was Christie's family's worst nightmare to hear that she had been taken out of state, they were still hopeful that she would be found alive. She was an extremely tough woman who could and would fight back. Her brother Richard said, I think she's better prepared for this situation than anyone else. That's what keeps us positive. Authorities attempted to lift fingerprints off Christie's phone, but for some reason the homeowner had cleaned it after finding it. By August 15th, the search had widened to a 400-acre area, but it was very hot under the August sun, so searchers worked in shifts and tried their best to stay hydrated. The search continued until August 22nd, but there was still no sign of 38-year-old Christy Cornwell, so the GBI called off the physical search and said they'd continue investigating her abduction, which they now believed to have been committed by a stranger who was familiar with the area. That same day, the Cornwell family won on America's Most Wanted and announced a $50,000 reward for information leading to the recovery of Christy Cornwell. After authorities called off the physical search for Christy, the Cornwell family basically took over and continued their efforts. Her brother Richard actually quit his engineering job in Knoxville and started spending around 80 hours a week looking for Christy. Christy's father, Harold, an experienced outdoorsman, coordinated ground searches. Richard took care of air searches in his own Cessna airplane while his friends searched via their own aircrafts. The family also created a website, distributed flyers, keychains, and bumper stickers. But when no tips came in and media coverage started dwindling, the Cornwells knew they had to do something different. They decided to sell their lakefront vacation home to raise money. Joanne and Harold had owned the home since 1958, and it was beloved by the family, but nowhere near as beloved as Christy Lee. The house sold for around 390000 and the money was used to pay for the construction of a helipad, helicopter rentals, newspaper ads, and 80,000 postcards mailed to area residents. GBI agent Mike Ayers later told CBS News that the Cornwell family's devotion to finding Christie was, quote, unlike anything he'd seen in more than 20 years as an investigator. In September, authorities thought they may have found another big lead after an abandoned campsite with some questionable items was found in the Chattahoochee National Forest, which is near the Cornwell residence. Authorities wondered if the campsite had any connection to Christie, but after examining the area, they realized it didn't. However, they were able to connect the campsite to a murder, Meredith Emerson's. The campsite had belonged to Gary Hilton. In December, when Christie's 39th birthday went by, Investigators got their first major lead. A woman had seen news coverage of Christie's abduction, and it reminded her of something that happened to her just nine days before Christie was abducted. Although it happened 30 minutes away in Ranger, North Carolina, the similarities were eerie. On August 2nd, at around 9 p.m., the woman was walking on a remote and not heavily trafficked road near a community center when a silver Nissan Xterra struck her from behind. It was just hard enough that she fell to the ground. The driver got out of the Xterra and approached her, and she started screaming. But then another vehicle approached, and the man got back into the Xterra and left, 
as he drove by, his driver's side window was rolled down and the woman was able to see the man's profile. The woman had immediately called the police, but the officer who spoke to her did not file a police report because he couldn't prove there'd been a hit and run. This sounds crazy to me. And this meant that authorities working Christie's case never knew about this possible connection. The GBI worked with the woman and released a sketch of the suspect and a photo of the vehicle. The man was described as being in his mid-twenties with dark hair and he was driving a silver Nissan Xterra with tinted windows and a brush guard on the front. After the sketch was released, another woman called the GBI to say she recognized the sketch. The same man had tried to abduct her two months before Christy was abducted. She had been fixing her car on the side of the road in a rural area of Morgan County when the man came up behind her and tried to grab her, but she fought him off. This woman helped create a full frontal sketch of the suspect's face, which was then released. I'll have it on my social media. Authorities now had two sketches and a full car description, but it still wasn't enough. There was no sign of Christy Cornwell. In January 2010, sheriff's offices in Union County and Cherokee County, where Ranger is located, each received a typed letter from an anonymous woman who said her 27-year-old grandson drove a white Nissan Xterra with black bars on the front and looked like the sketch of the suspect from the attempted abduction in Ranger. She thought he was involved in that incident and in Christie's abduction. The woman said her grandson came to visit her in Western North Carolina on August 1, 2009. He was going to help with some repairs to her house. She wrote, each day after working, my grandson would leave for four or five hours and return around 11 or 12 o'clock. On August 11th, he did not return until seven o'clock the next morning. He returned with some scratches on his face and left side of his neck. When I asked him what happened, he said he was in a fight and was ready to go back home. On the 12th, he packed up his stuff and left. The letter read, I pray this information is meaningless and I have no proof of any wrongdoing. I want to give the benefit of doubt until proven otherwise. However, I will not turn a blind eye to my suspicions. The letters and envelopes were sent to the GBI to see if there was any usable evidence, but there wasn't. The envelopes had been postmarked in Charlotte, North Carolina, and there was no return address or fingerprints on either one. The only other notable thing about the envelopes was that they were addressed with a purple ink pen. Put that in your back pocket for a second. The GBI wasn't sure if the letters were a hoax or not. But just in case they weren't, the GBI responded with an open letter to the grandmother that read, quote, Dear Concerned Grandmother, you cannot ignore the chain of coincidences surrounding your grandson's 12-day stay with you in August 2009. I believe you are a godly and caring person. You made the right decision by contacting us with your letter. I now ask you to continue your journey with us and contact me. I understand that you have concerns about your family, and I ask that you pray about your decision and do what is right. When the open letter didn't bring any answers, the GBI asked Christie's mom, Joanne, to make a video pleading for the anonymous grandma to come forward. The video was released by multiple agencies, but the grandma never did come forward. Instead, sadly, Joanne received numerous upsetting prank phone calls. The next big lead in Christie's abduction came in April 2010 when Gilmer County, Georgia authorities asked the same GBI office handling Christie's abduction to help with a rape investigation involving a Nissan Xterra. On April 6th, a 19-year-old Kennesaw State student met a relative of hers, unemployed house appraiser, James Scott Carringer, in the parking lot of Dick's Sporting Goods. In his black Nissan Xterra, Carringer took the girl against her will to a dirt, logging-type road off GI-515, where he then raped her. After the attack, Carringer drove the girl back to town and released her. She went to North Georgia Medical Center in Gilmore County to report the rape. 
An investigation into Carringer told authorities that he was born on December 26, 1967, in Cherokee County, North Carolina, to parents James and Janice. In 1986, he graduated from Murphy High School and then later became a house builder and appraiser. He even co-owned and operated the appraisal agency. But in 2002, his license was revoked. In April 2010, when he kidnapped and raped his relative, Carringer was unemployed. He was also estranged from his wife Judy and his two children. During the investigation into Carringer, authorities realized that he almost perfectly fit the profile of the suspect for the two attempted abductions and Christie's abduction. He looked like the sketches, and he drove an Xterra. Plus, he had a history of violence. In 2000, he was arrested on a felony charge of assault to inflict serious injury. He took a deal and pled guilty to a misdemeanor. But that's not all. In August 2009, Carringer lived in Young Harris, which was less than 10 miles northeast of where Christie was abducted. And he was originally from Brasstown, North Carolina, which is around 12 miles east of Ranger. And the cherry on top? In addition to the black Xterra used to abduct his relative, Carringer owned two other Xterras, a white one and a silver one. It seemed like investigators finally had their guy. They just needed to interview him and show him all the evidence they had against him. Hopefully, he'd confess and help them find Christy. Officers obtained an arrest warrant for Carringer for the rape of his relative. On April 8th at around 5.30 a.m., police received a call about a suspicious black Xterra parked behind a pizza restaurant in Buckhead, an upscale area of Atlanta. When police arrived, Carringer was inside the vehicle. He told police he was going to kill himself and had explosives and a gun. Officers backed off, called a SWAT team in, and closed off the nearby street. Around 20 minutes later, police heard a gunshot from inside the vehicle. At around 8 a.m., a bomb squad robot approached the Xterra and used an explosive device to knock out a window. When police approached, they found Carringer dead. There were no explosives found inside. However, there was a suicide note. According to Disappeared, the only information about this note that has been released was that Carringer wrote about being sexually abused at 10 years old by a neighbor. The GBI went on record saying that there was nothing in the letter that helped their investigations. While processing the Xterra, an Atlanta officer remembered seeing something about a black Xterra being involved in a recent attempted abduction two and a half hours away in Montgomery, Alabama. This incident had all been caught on surveillance camera. On April 4th, a 10-year-old little girl and her brother were hiding Easter eggs at Hunter Station Baptist Church when a man in a black Xterra drove past them, circled back, got out, and asked the siblings to come talk to him. When they got close enough, the man pushed the brother, grabbed the girl, and threw her in the car. As the Xterra backed out of the parking lot, the little girl jumped out, and the siblings ran away. The Atlanta police officer notified Montgomery police about Carringer's possible involvement, and within a week, they were able to confirm that he was the man responsible. Investigators were also hoping to be able to confirm Carringer's involvement in the abduction of Christy Cornwell and the attempted abductions of the woman in Ranger and the woman who was fixing her car on the side of the road. But since Carringer had died by suicide, they would never get to question him or hold him responsible. The only thing they could do was continue their investigation and meet with Carringer's family to look for some insight into his involvement in these abductions and attempted abductions. His estranged wife Judy told authorities that Carringer would often turn his phone off then not notify anyone for hours, days, or up to a week. Judy also said that right before Christy went missing, Carringer and his daughter had a falling out and were no longer speaking. And around the same time, his stepdaughter moved out. This had left him feeling like he'd lost control over his family. 
Judy also told them that not long after Christy was abducted, Carringer gifted the silver Xterra to his stepson. Judy said that Carringer hadn't even asked her about giving the car away. It just seemed totally random and out of nowhere. Investigators were able to recover both the silver and white Xterras and brought them in for examination. That's when they realized the silver Xterra had been altered. Carringer had taken the brush guard off the front of the car because he knew authorities were looking for that exact style of car. When investigators searched Carringer's backyard, they found the brush guard. It had been thrown out in the woods behind his house. And when investigators searched Carringer's house, they found something very interesting. He owned several purple ink pens, just like the ones used to write the anonymous letters to police, the ones that were supposedly written by a concerned grandmother. Because Carringer was known to turn his phone off while he disappeared, it was difficult for investigators to track his movements. However, in December 2010, the GBI was able to track some cell phone pings from Carringer's phone that were made at around 11.30 p.m., just two hours after abducting Christy. Using the pings, his whereabouts were narrowed down to a two-square-mile area around nine miles from where Christy was abducted. The GBI planned to search the area in late January 2011, but first decided to share the information with Christy's brother Richard, who was still tirelessly searching for his sister. On New Year's Day of 2011, Richard went out searching in the two-square-mile area the GBI had told him about. Around 75 yards from Moccasin Creek Road, just south of the North Carolina border, Richard found Christie's skeletonized remains, which had been burned and partially buried by debris. By January 3rd, the GBI confirmed that the remains belonged to Christie via dental records. However, her cause of death could not be determined. Richard told reporters, We're thankful that Christie can now have a proper burial that she deserves. Christie's mom, Joanne, said, We didn't want it to end this way but that's the way it is, and we can bring her home now. I know in my heart she's in heaven and we'll see her again, so that's what's going to make me be able to go on. When Haley first told me about this case, I looked it up and I immediately got tears in my eyes when I read of Christy's brother quitting his job in search for his beloved sister. I immediately wanted to cover her case because of the heart of Christy's entire family. I was also deeply disturbed by the crimes of James Scott Carringer. To me, he feels like a serial killer. He was taking great risk by escalating with family members, including raping his teenage relative and doing God knows what to make his daughters run from his home. And then he tried to grab that 10-year-old little girl on Easter Sunday. It reminds me of how Ted Bundy was devolving with his last young victim. I'm so glad. Carringer's victim escaped. We will never know just how many women Carringer raped and murdered. Since he took his own life, he also took his secrets to the grave. But we are left with the courage, the fortitude, and the tireless love of Christie's family. I am so thankful her brother found her remains, so they were able to lay Christie to rest and hopefully feel some measure of peace. Southern Fraud True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was written and researched by the amazing Haley Gray and myself. Southern Fraud's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, and go to the Listener Suggestion tab. And if you've submitted a case suggestion in the last few months, please resubmit it on the website. I was very overwhelmed by email when I came back from my sick leave, and I have never caught up. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all know I love when you send to me. And come join our Facebook group, Southern Fraud True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. 
Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, and Spotify. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.